This episode of Legal Eagle was made possible by Skillshare. Learn to think like a lawyer for free for two months by clicking on the link in the description. Hey, Legal Eagles, it's time to think like a lawyer because the president could use some good advice, unlike the bad legal advice he seems to be getting at the moment. Today, we're going to discuss one of the newest scandals to rock the White House, the allegations of bribery and potential abuse of power by President Trump in exchange for getting dirt on presidential candidate Joe Biden. All hell seems to be breaking loose here in Washington, and although you could probably say that on any given day, this time it seems to be a little different because of one thing. House Democrats have announced that they are formally opening an inquiry into the impeachment of the President of the United States. This doesn't happen every day. To understand how we got here, you need to know the facts about Donald Trump's conversation with the President of Ukraine, a mysterious high-level whistleblower, the many faces of Rudy Giuliani, and what all of that has to do with Joe Biden's son. So to take a step back, Ukraine is a country in Eastern Europe that was formerly a part of the Soviet Union. The country currently has a rocky relationship with Russia because Russian troops have invaded part of Ukraine's territory, the Crimea, back in 2014. Ukrainian citizens protested Russian involvement in their government, ousting President Viktor Yanukovych for conspiring with Russia. Now, the United States and most of the world condemned Russia and warned it against further interference in Ukrainian sovereignty. Later that same year, then Vice President Biden went to Ukraine to deliver U.S. aid. Now, fast forward a few years, in July of 2019, the Washington Post reported that a high-ranking intelligence official had filed a whistleblower complaint about promises that President Trump had made during communication and interaction with a foreign leader. Several news organizations reported that this whistleblower complaint involved President Trump promising aid to Ukraine if they dug up some dirt on Hunter Biden, Joe Biden's son. Trump himself confirmed part of this story. Hunter Biden was a member of the board of a company called Burisma Holdings, the largest gas company in Ukraine. That company was known for having some ties to former president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych. Hunter Biden remained a board member of Burisma until 2019. So what is the deal with this intelligence community whistleblower? Well, I probably don't need to tell you that it is incredibly unusual for a member of the intelligence community to, number one, file a whistleblower complaint. There are strict guidelines that one must follow in order to blow the whistle on the intelligence community. And it is almost unheard of that a whistleblower would blow the whistle on the president of the United States. That's just has never happened before. And on September 9th, Intelligence Community General Inspector, or the ICIG, Michael Atkinson informed representatives Adam Schiff and Devin Nunez, who were on the House Intelligence Committee, that he had forwarded a whistleblower report to Acting Director of National Intelligence, Joseph McGuire. A whistleblower is a person who exposes information that he or she believes is illegal or unethical. Governmental whistleblowers are not unusual, but a whistleblower at this level of the government in the intelligence community may making an allegation of the president absolutely is incredibly unusual. Inspector Atkinson determined that the report was, quote, an urgent concern, end quote, and, quote, credible. Urgent and credible are two statutory requirements that require the ICIG to forward the complaint to Congress. Atkinson's ruling immediately made this a very serious allegation that Congress wanted to review. However, acting director of national intelligence, McGuire, stepped in to claim that the complaint was not required to be released to Congress. Now, remember this fact about acting DNI McGuire, as we'll come back to it later. This fact could be the first indication of a cover-up by the White House and the Department of Justice. At the time of this video, we don't have all of the facts. We don't have the entire ICIG complaint, but news reports are indicating that President Trump may have threatened to withhold $400 million in military aid to Ukraine if it did not investigate Hunter Biden, among other things. The Trump administration had criticized the Obama administration for not providing lethal foreign aid to Ukraine in its fight against Russia. So earlier this year, Congress appropriated almost $400 million in military aid, $250 million in explicit military aid, and $150 million going through the State Department that can be used for lethal force by the Ukrainians to buy military goods from the Americans. The argument, of course, being that Ukraine needs that military aid to help it fight against Russia in Crimea, and was approved by the Pentagon and Congress. However, for months, President Trump froze that military aid. Some reports indicate the government employees were instructed to obfuscate or 
lie to Congress about the reason for why that money was frozen. It's not necessarily unusual to freeze this kind of military aid, but under these circumstances, it appears to be highly unusual, and we'll get to why in just a moment. Although there is much speculation over the contents of the whistleblower report, President Trump and his personal lawyer and advisor, Rudy Giuliani, started confirming aspects of this particular story just days after it was broken. President Trump spoke with new Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky by telephone on July 25th, just days after Robert Mueller had testified in Congress, when President Trump allegedly mentioned his desire to have Biden investigated up to eight times. According to Trump, he summarized his phone call as saying, We had a great conversation. Uh, the conversation I had was largely congratulatory, was largely corruption, all of the corruption taking place, was largely the fact that we don't want our people like Vice President Biden and his son creating to the, the corruption already in the Ukraine. In Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's got a lot of problems. President Trump described the phone call as, quote, perfect. It's very important to talk about corruption. If you don't talk about corruption, why would you give money to a country that you think is, is corrupt? So it's very important that on occasion you speak to somebody about corruption. So President Trump agrees that he spoke about alleged corruption by the Bidens and that he also was reluctant to give money to Ukraine because he says the country is corrupt. A potential flaw with this argument is that the United States gives military aid to many different countries, not the least of which is Saudi Arabia, but the president does not seem to be doing any kind of corruption analysis with respect to those other countries. This may be specifically uh, geared towards Ukraine and these unusual circumstances. But President Trump wasn't done yet. Speaking of a few days later at the United Nations, President Trump said, Joe Biden and his son are corrupt, all right? But the fake news doesn't want to report it because they're Democrats. If that ever happened, if a Republican ever did what Joe Biden did, if a Republican ever said what Joe Biden said, they'd be getting the electric chair by right now. So what is it that President Trump alleges the Bidens did? President Trump alleges that Joe Biden used American financial aid to pressure the Ukrainian government to fire its top prosecutor in 2016. The theory is that the prosecutor, Viktor Shokin, was investigating Ukraine's largest gas company, Burisma. Although President Trump has been vague about what the Bidens did that deserved the so-called electric chair, the corruption allegations have been investigated and dismissed. Shokin was accused of being soft on corruption. The United States was not alone in calling for his ouster. Other Western nations in the entire European Union also called on Ukraine to remove him. And the Ukrainian parliament eventually voted to remove Shokin. According to Bloomberg News, which did an extensive report on the matter in 2019, the Burisma investigation had already been dead for about a year by the time that Vice President Biden called for Shokin to be sacked. And there is no indication that Hunter Biden personally was being investigated for corruption. The former Ukrainian prosecutor general told Bloomberg that he found no evidence of wrongdoing by either Biden. But President Trump would not let that debunked story die, stating Biden, quote, said, I'm not going to give billions of dollars to Ukraine unless they remove this prosecutor. And they removed the prosecutor supposedly in one hour. And the prosecutor was prosecuting the company of the the sun and the sun. He just shouldn't have said that. Now, as far as my conversation, it was perfect. It was a perfect conversation. As you may be aware, Joe Biden has consistently been the Democratic frontrunner against President Trump in the 2020 presidential election and has consistently led Donald Trump in head-to-head -head polls. President Trump and Rudy Giuliani have already confirmed many aspects, although not all of the aspects of this particular story. So what's going up with Rudy Giuliani, you may ask? Well, Rudy Giuliani is one of the president's personal lawyers. He has no formal job with the US government, but uh, allegedly has been acting as a messenger for President Trump with Ukraine. In another one of Mr. Giuliani's legendary TV appearances, Giuliani has admitted that he spent several months pressuring Ukraine for dirt on the Bidens. Appearing on Chris Cuomo's CNN program, Giuliani said- The only thing I ask about Joe Biden is to get to the bottom of how it was that Lutsenko, who was appointed, right. dismissed the case against Antac. So you did ask Ukraine to look into Joe Biden? Of course I did. So we already know that Giuliani met with Ukrainian officials in May and August of this year. The August meeting was just a week after President Trump froze all of the military aid 
that Congress and the Pentagon had appropriated for Ukraine. Giuliani said that during the August meeting, a Ukrainian official promised to, quote, get to the bottom, end quote, of the Biden situation. The Wall Street Journal reported that this was part of an ongoing effort by President Trump to have the Ukrainians work with Giuliani to find some dirt on the Bidens in exchange for the promised aid. Now, on its face, there are major problems with Giuliani's role in all of this. Giuliani is not a member of the US government and should not be conducting US foreign policy. And if Giuliani is conducting US foreign policy, then attorney-client privilege can't attach to communications between the president and his advisor. Now, there of course may be executive privilege issues here, but it would be highly unusual to have executive privilege with your own personal lawyer. Additionally, if the US government needs foreign assistance with an investigation, there are proper channels to go through. If there is a mutual legal assistance treaty or MLAT in place between countries, then that's the proper outlet for asking for a foreign country to invest investigate particular crimes. The US has an MLAT with Ukraine. So the proper channels for this would be for the DOJ to talk to the State Department, to talk to the legal attache in the Ukrainian embassy, which would then liaise with uh, law enforcement agencies in Ukraine. Suffice to say, the proper channel is not your personal lawyer, Rudy Giuliani. And while I am loath to give any credibility to the crazy things that Rudy Giuliani says, I think it is worth going into what Rudy Giuliani claims in this particular case. So I know I've thrown a ton of facts at you, but here's a timeline of what I think we know right now. This is a fluid situation. It's changing hour by hour. Believe me, I have tried to make this video for several days, but the facts just keep changing. But here's what I think we know right now. On May 10th, 2019, Rudy Giuliani cancels a trip to Ukraine just one day after saying he would be, quote, meddling in an investigation and giving Ukraine's new government, quote, reasons why they shouldn't stop it because that information will be very, very helpful to my client, end quote. Shortly thereafter, on July 25th, President Trump talks with new Ukrainian Prime Minister Zelensky on the phone. According to Ukraine's readout of the call, President Trump indicated that Ukraine should, quote, complete investigation of corruption cases, which inhibited the interaction between Ukraine and and the United States. Oh, oh, hold on, this is breaking news. And my life, the whole transcript has been released. All right, we'll get to that in just a second. On August 28th, Politico reported that President Trump froze hundreds of millions of dollars in aid to Ukraine and Congress is in the dark about why. On September 1st, Vice President Mike Pence meets with Zelensky in Poland. On September 9th, after learning about the whistleblower complaint, the House Foreign Affairs Intelligence and Oversight Committees announced an investigation into whether President Trump and Giuliani have, quote, increased pressure on the Ukrainian government and its justice system in service of President Trump's reelection campaign. The next day on September 10th, Intelligence Committee Chairman Schiff begins corresponding with acting DNI McGuire about the whistleblower complaint. On September 11th, the White House releases the military aid to Ukraine. On September 19th, when reports emerge that Ukraine may be the subject of the ICIG complaint, Giuliani tells CNN that he told Ukraine to investigate Biden. This is confirmed on Twitter, where he says that the Bidens, quote, built millions of dollars from Ukraine and billions from China. After House Speaker Nancy Pelosi announced a formal impeachment inquiry on Tuesday night, President Trump decided to release the full readout of the call with Zelensky in full unclassified. So, uh, if you'll give me one second. <sighs> okay, so we're back. I have the transcript. Oh boy. So, uh, as President Trump indicated, it does start off with a congratulation of President Zelensky. But things take a turn for the worse as we go further down this transcript. Early in the call, President Trump starts talking about the aid that the US is supposed to offer to Ukraine, saying, I will say that we do a lot for Ukraine. We spend a lot of effort and a lot of time, much more than European countries are doing, and they should be helping you more than they are. He goes on to say, the United States has been very, very good to Ukraine. I wouldn't say that it's reciprocal, necessarily because things are happening that are not good, but the United States has been very, very good to Ukraine. At that point, President Zelensky acknowledges the aid the United States is supposed to be providing and goes one step further. He says, I'm very grateful to you for that because the United States is doing quite a lot for Ukraine. 
we are ready to continue to cooperate for the next step specifically. We are almost ready to buy more javelins, which are missiles, from the United States for defense purposes. And as some background, this is how military aid from the United States works. You provide a boatload of money to a specific country, and they in turn give that right back to the United States arms makers who provide the arms to the foreign countries. So in a way, it's almost a subsidy for American arms makers as much as it is foreign aid to another country. It's at that point that President Trump asks President Zelensky for a favor. He says, I would like you to do us a favor though, because our country has been through a lot and Ukraine knows a lot about it. I would like you to find out what happened with this whole situation with Ukraine. They say cloud strike. That appears to be a reference to a QAnon level insane conspiracy theory that the Ukrainians had conducted the Russian hacking that was against the Democratic National Convention. The DNC hired this company cloud strike and there there is a crackpot theory that the Ukrainians were involved somehow. I, I refuse to go any further than that. He continues, I guess you have one of your wealthy people. There's an ellipsis. There may be more there that's not contained in this readout, but we don't know why there is an ellipsis at this point. The server, they say Ukraine has it. There are a lot of things that went on, the whole situation. I think you're surrounding yourself with some of the same people. I would like to have the Attorney General, that's Attorney General Barr, call you or your people, and I would like you to get to the bottom of it. So there we have the first thing that President Trump wants from the Ukrainians, which is to investigate the Democrats, the server. I think this is a reference to Hillary's emails and the, the Democratic National Convention hacking. At that point, President Zelensky goes on to say, and respond, I would also like and hope to see him having your trust, that's the ambassador, and your confidence in having personal relationships with you so we can cooperate even more so. I will personally tell you that one of my assistants spoke with Giuliani just recently. So Zelensky has been coordinating with Rudy Giuliani. At that point, there is a pivot to the Bidens. President Trump says, I heard you had a prosecutor who was very good and he was shut down and that's really unfair. A lot of people are talking about that, the way they shut your very good prosecutor down and you had some very bad people involved. Mr. Giuliani is a highly respected man. He was the mayor of New York City, a great mayor, and I would like him to call you. I will ask him to call you along with the Attorney General, again, that's Attorney General Barr, Rudy very much knows what's happening and he is a very capable guy. If you could speak to him, that would be great. The former ambassador from the United States, the woman, was bad news and the people she was dealing with in the Ukraine were bad news. So I just want to let you know that. The other thing, there's a lot of talk about Biden's son, that Biden stopped the prosecution and a lot of people want to find out about that. So whatever you can do with the Attorney General would be great. Biden went around bragging that he stopped the prosecution. So if you could look into it, ellipsis, we don't know what else is there. It sounds horrible to me. Zelensky responds and goes on to say, the next prosecutor general will be 100% my person, my candidate who will be approved by the parliament and will start as a new prosecutor in September. He or she will look into the situation specifically to the company that you mentioned in this issue, which presumably is Burisma. So there you have it. This may not be an explicit quid pro quo, but this is about as close as you can get. President Trump asked for uh, an investigation into the 2016 hacking and cloud strike. And the other thing that he asked for was an investigation into Joe Biden and Joe Biden's son. Now, finally, I will mention parenthetically that at the very end of this conversation, the Ukrainian president makes it a point to tell Donald Trump one thing. And that is, he says, I would like to tell you that I also have quite a few Ukrainian friends that live in the United States. Actually, last time I traveled to the United States, I stayed in New York near Central Park and I stayed at Trump Tower. So all of those people who have been talking about the emoluments cases that are going on in the fourth and second circuit just got a whole lot of information that foreign officials like to stay at Trump properties for the purpose of influencing the president, Donald Trump. Now, I wanna emphasize that this is not a verbatim transcript of the telephone call. This is just a readout, it's a summary based on uh, impressions and based on uh, auto recognition software. So it, it doesn't convey everything that went into this conversation and there may be more nuance than appears just on the, the dry written page. And additionally, there may be additional context that would help understand this conversation itself. Uh, uh, uh...
Okay. All right. Uh, ABC News is now reporting that uh, the Ukrainians were briefed ahead of time by the Trump administration, telling them that this conversation was going to discuss the Biden allegations, and it was basically going to be all about what the Ukrainians could do to gin up information about the Bidens. So, yeah, uh, I guess in terms of additional context, it just makes it worse that the Ukrainians knew ahead of time that uh, this was gonna be about the Biden conspiracy theory. Now, I also want to emphasize that this uh, readout of the July 25th call is just one of the instances mentioned apparently in the whistleblower complaint and that there could be much more out there. We, we don't know. We'll need to see not only the whistleblower complaint, but all the underlying evidence. So that takes us to the whistleblower complaint and the whistleblower. The intelligence community whistleblower statute is set up to provide a pathway for individuals to come forward with allegations of urgent concern in a way that does not endanger classified information. Uh, wait, hold on a second. Oh, come on. All right, apparently the whistleblower complaint is out. Give me one second. Jeez. <sighs> okay. Uh, I now have the whistleblower complaint in its unclassified form, and things keep getting worse. This is insane. Um, so let's just go over uh, the new allegations of the whistleblower complaint itself and we can talk about the repercussions thereof. Uh, so it starts out as uh, sort of summarizing what we already knew from the transcript of the phone call with Zelensky and Trump. This whistleblower is concerned that the president was using the power of his office to solicit interference from a foreign country. The president's personal lawyer, Rudolph Giuliani, is a central figure in this effort, and Attorney General Barr appears to be involved as well. The involvement of Barr himself may require him to be recused from further proceedings. Uh, I guess we'll have to learn more information about that. But this whistleblower says over a half dozen US officials have informed him of the various facts related to this case. Now, the whistleblower, uh, whose identity we still don't yet know, is forthright and says that they were not a direct witness to some of the events that they are describing and are relying on the testimony of somewhere between six and over a dozen individuals in the White House and the intelligence community, but that they are concerned that the actions that they have credible reports of pose risks to U.S. national security and undermine the U.S. government efforts to deter and counter foreign interference in U.S. elections. This whistleblower then goes on to talk about the July 25th phone call that we now have the readout of and sort of summarizes the main events of uh, that phone call. It's interesting to note that uh, the, the readout that the White House released first before releasing the uh, whistleblower complaint effectively corroborates exactly what this person is summarizing here. It's not clear if this whistleblower was privy to that readout or not, uh, but the information that this person had apparently was spot on. As we already knew from the readout of the call, Trump did indeed uh, use the opportunity to uh, advance his personal interests in the call with the Ukrainian prime minister as the whistleblower talks about pressuring the Ukrainian leader to take steps to help the president's 2020 election bid. The information that is summarized in this whistleblower complaint appears to jive with the transcript itself that it talks about the president trying to encourage an investigation into uh, Vice President Biden and his son, asking the Ukrainians in help uncovering that allegations of Russian interference in the 2016 US presidential election originated in Ukraine. And there's a footnote to this particular uh, allegation where the whistleblower uh, drops a footnote and says, I do not know why the president associates these servers with Ukraine, which is just throwing shade on the insane conspiracy theory that relates to CrowdStrike, the DNC, and the, the, the uh, Rus Russian hacking. It appears to, sh to show that the president still in 2019 believes the Russians were not involved in the hacking and that he believes this, this crazy conspiracy theory. So even the IC community 
is not <laughs> is not buying uh, the president's uh, conspiracy theory nonsense. And then going further, that the president asked the president of Ukraine to talk to his personal envoys, uh, Mr. Giuliani and Attorney General Barr, uh, to whom the president referred to multiple times in tandem. I mean, this alone, again, uh, not only implicates Rudy Giuliani in malfeasance, but also Attorney General Barr. Congress is going to have to follow up and, and find out what Rudy Giuliani said to whom and when, uh, as well as what Attorney General Barr's involvement was as well. And it may require Attorney General Barr to recuse himself from everything related to this scandal. The complaint talks about being deeply disturbed uh, and that uh, many people, in addition to the ones already discussed, uh, were concerned that they had witnessed the president abused his office for uh, personal gain. And the whistleblower talks about how precautions had not been taken in advance of the phone call because everyone expected that it would be a routine call with a foreign leader. So then we get to a particularly concerning portion of this complaint. And these are new allegations that were not revealed as part of the transcript readout, which is that apparently the White House has engaged in efforts to restrict access to the phone call because either President Trump or those associated with President Trump knew that the actions that had been taken had crossed a line. So this uh, whistleblower alleges that in the days following the phone call, I learned from multiple US officials that senior White House officials had intervened to lock down all records of the phone call, especially the official word for word transcript of the call that was produced as is customary by the White House Situation Room. This whistleblower goes on to say that uh, the White House officials told me that they were quote, directed by White House lawyers, White House lawyers, to remove the electronic transcript from the computer system in which such transcripts are typically stored for coordination, finalization, and distribution to cabinet level officials. Instead, the transcript was loaded into a separate electronic system that is otherwise used to store and handle classified information of an especially sensitive nature. One White House official described this act as an abuse of the electronic system because the call did not contain anything remotely sensitive from a national security perspective. This has uh, shades of the Nixon White House, that often it's the cover-up that's worse than the initial crime itself. But here, I mean, both are just bonkers in terms of the abuse of power and also the cover-up therein. I mean, not only did President Trump potentially engage in uh, an abuse of power, potentially bribery, potentially extortion, but also those around him are taking steps to cover up uh, those efforts to extort the Ukrainian president. <sighs> this is bad. Uh, I, I just, I, I don't see a other side to this. This is on par, if not worse, than what was uncovered in the 1974 Watergate scandal. I just, I, I don't see a second side to this. And in fact, the report goes on to say that during the same time frame, multiple US officials told me that the Ukrainian leadership was led to believe that a meeting or phone call between the president and President Zelensky would depend on whether Zelensky showed a willingness to play ball on the issues that had been publicly aired by Mr. Lutsenko and Mr. Giuliani. Mr. Lutsenko is the prosecutor who was uh, fired um, for corruption. And finally, the public portion of this complaint ends with, in mid-July, I learned of a sudden change of policy with respect to US assistance for Ukraine. That ends the unclassified portion of the whistleblower complaint, which leads to a classified appendix, only parts of which have been revealed. There are two things that are really interesting about this classified appendix. The first is in the first subsection, this whistleblower states that according to White House officials I spoke with, this was quote, not the first time under this administration that a presidential transcript was placed into this code word level system solely for the purpose of protecting politically sensitive rather than national security sensitive information. That is an incredible bombshell that the White House is uh, covering up other information that is politically damaging to President Trump and uh, squirreling it away in a system that was designed for national security information. Obviously, Congress is going to want to investigate the other instances of abusing this system. And uh, the Director of National Intelligence, this is exactly what they should be looking into, this kind of abuse of the national security apparatus. Finally, this whistleblower complaint 
talks about the uh, games that were being played with the $400 million of foreign military aid that was supposed to go to Ukraine, and states that on 18 July, uh, an Office of Management and Budget, that's OMB, officially informed departments and agencies that the president, quote, earlier that month had issued instructions to suspend all U.S. security assistance to Ukraine. That is the $400 million in aid. Neither OMB nor the NSC staff knew why this instruction had been issued. During the interagency meetings on 23 July and 26 July, OMB officials again stated explicitly that the instruction to suspend this ass assistance had come directly from the president but they were still unaware of a policy rationale. As of early August, I heard from U.S. officials that some Ukrainian officials were aware that U.S. aid might be in jeopardy, but I do not know how or when they learned of it. That is the pro to the quid and the quid pro quo of this whole situation is that there was a strange instruction uh, relayed by N Mick Mulvaney saying that the aid was not supposed to be dispersed. And that alone could be a dereliction of duty to, for the executive branch not to enforce the laws of the country, which had been appropriated by the Pentagon and Congress. But that it was done in a, a time frame that makes it very much look like it was done to make the Ukrainians, quote, play ball, as this complaint alleges. Uh, this is this is incredibly damning and very, very worrisome. Um, I don't know that there's two ways about it. There may not be an explicit quid pro quo in that the president literally says, you must do this in, in order to receive the foreign aid, but all of the circumstances make it seem like that is exactly what was implied, that the Ukrainians understood the rules of the game and that they wanted to play ball and the president may have abused his power, his, uh, the power of, of the office of the presidency in order to get dirt on political rivals. You might recall that the first volume of the Mueller report uh, found that there was no collusion, no conspiracy, no criminal conspiracy with Russia because the Trump campaign had not solicited the information. Had they done so, it's implicit in the Mueller report that they would have been guilty of a criminal conspiracy. And it's almost as if they took the Mueller report as a roadmap to then say, okay, well, we'll then go out and do it ourselves. This is the kind of action, the kind of proactive seeking of information that is what criminal conspiracies are, are made of. So with that, that takes us to the actual process of the whistleblower complaint. When Atkinson described the process, he said it was meant to allow people who complained to contact congressional intelligence committees directly. The first step is to go to the IG, the inspector general. The IG then has two weeks to conduct a preliminary investigation into whether the complaint is both credible and of urgent concern. An urgent concern is considered to be a quote, serious or flagrant problem, abuse, violation of the law of executive order or deficiency. The IG is then supposed to relay the complaint up the chain of command and share his preliminary findings with the director of national intelligence, the DNI. The DNI is then charged with giving that information to congressional oversight committees. In this particular case, this was not done. On the contrary, acting DNI McGuire hired a lawyer to send a letter asserting that, quote, no statute requires disclosure of the complaint to the intelligence committees because, quote, the disclosure in this case did not concern allegations of conduct by a member of the intelligence community or involve an intelligence activity under the DNI's supervision. Essentially, McGuire is disagreeing with his own inspector general determination that the information in the complaint is credible and urgent, but a close reading of 50 USC 3033 suggests that the DNI may lack the authority to overrule the IG on this determination. In a September 17th response to Representative Schiff, McGuire refused to release the report to Congress, citing three particular criteria. One, the whistleblower report does not meet the definition of urgent concern. Two, the complaint concerns someone outside of the intelligence community, presumably the president of the United States. And three, the report was unrelated to intelligence activities. It doesn't appear in the statute that the DNI has the authority to overrule the factual findings of the ICIG in finding that the whistleblower's complaint was both credible and urgent. But by the same token, if the OLC or the Department of Justice has issued an opinion that says that they can't turn over that information, then the ICIG's hands may be tied. But by the same token, that may itself constitute an obstruction of justice. So we'll see how this shakes out because it doesn't seem like this is going away anytime soon. 
But I want to emphasize again that it would be very helpful to hear from acting DNI McGuire as to how all of these events went down. Oh, come on. All right, McGuire just testified. Uh, apparently, so director McGuire says that when he received the uh, urgent and credible complaint from the whistleblower and the ICIG, he then took it up the chain of command to get a, an opinion from the Office of Legal Counsel and the DOJ, and also to get counsel from the White House uh, about whether executive privilege applies. The problem with that, and in normal circumstances, that's probably the right thing to do, but the problem here is that it's the White House and the Attorney General, who is the head of the Department of Justice, who are implicated in this whistleblower complaint. I don't know that McGuire was wrong to get their opinions, but man, it looks bad when the person or persons who are accused of a crime and an abuse of power are the ones that you're asking if you can release the whistleblower complaint. But for now, at least, we have the readout slash transcript. We have the complaint from the whistleblower. I'm sure in the coming weeks and months, we will hear from the whistleblower themselves. We will hear from potentially the White House officials and members of the intelligence community who are uh, mentioned in this whistleblower complaint. Uh, we will hear from the uh, Inspector General of the Intelligence Community. We'll probably get more information, but it's hard to imagine uh, what could possibly be worse than what we already know now, what's on the record. Um, but one thing is for certain, this is not going to go away. This has already implicated dozens of officials in the White House. This story is, is only going to get bigger over time. This is not going to go away. This is not a small thing. This is not the news glomming on to uh, some small nitpick. This appears to be uh, on par, if not far exceeding what happened with Watergate. And things are going to get bigger before they get smaller. And that brings us to impeachment. If these allegations are true, can the president be impeached? You'll be able to find a detailed breakdown of what constitutes an impeachable offense in a video that I'm working on and I'll release in a couple of days. But experts have already started to weigh in on whether repeatedly asking a foreign country to investigate a political opponent is impeachable, whether there is an express quid pro quo or not. If the president asked the president of Ukraine to investigate the Bidens in exchange for already promised aid, then Trump has leveraged a foreign government into helping him to defeat a political opponent. This would be a gross abuse of presidential power. And most people point to the triggering of impeachment being high crimes and misdemeanors. But people forget that impeachment is triggered not only by high crimes and misdemeanors, but also treason and bribery. And I think bribery is the operative word there. The US Code 18 USC 201 deals with the bribery of public officials and witnesses. Scholars disagree on whether that particular statute applies to the president, but clearly that statute would be subsumed into the general statement that bribery is enough to trigger impeachment of the president of the United States. And the facts as we know them could lend themselves to a conclusion that the president solicited bribery bribery from a foreign official in the, in the form of political dirt on a political rival in exchange for releasing uh, foreign aid to Ukraine. And as former federal prosecutor Renato Mariotti points out, whether this actually fits into the specific bribery statute or federal election statutes misses the point. This is more than just a garden variety crime. It's worse, as he points out. Mere bribery probably understates the magnitude of the malfeasance here. What is alleged is a draw-jopping abuse of power. The criminal process isn't equipped to deal with this, and even if it were, it's possible the DOJ can't indict a sitting president. And let's say it doesn't meet the technical definition of bribery because a statute doesn't apply to the president as the head of state or sovereign immunity applies. Critics will then say everything is all good because it's not bribery itself. Whether these actions meet the strict definition of bribery, we know now that the president has used the power of his office to dig up dirt from foreign officials. The transcript confirms, if not an explicit quid pro quo, at the very least, a very strong implied quid pro quo. This could be solicitation of a bribe, but it's definitely an abuse of power, pure and simple. <sighs> okay, I thought I was done. I thought today would be a good day to get a haircut. But no, apparently I need to somehow link the scandal to Skillshare, which is one of my favorite sponsors, but you know, still. Ugh. Um, 
you know, I guess getting smaller countries to do what you want takes persuasion. And if you need to pressure foreign powers into investigating political rivals, there's no skill that you need to hone more than your persuasion skills. And with Skillshare's Storytelling for Leaders course, you'll learn how to bribe and blackmail without getting impeached. As a leader, it's up to you to communicate meaningfully about your work and your aspirations. Whether it's for marketing materials, a client presentation, a unifying story to fire up your team, or to convince a foreign president to investigate your political rivals. Keith Yamashita will teach you how to craft a compelling story that matters to your audience, even if your audience is the president of Ukraine. Ah, oh, it's fun to joke when Rome is burning, isn't it? But seriously, this is actually a really good course, all kidding aside. Skillshare is an online learning community that has tens of thousands of classes on everything like music, design, technology, and business. Legal Eagles will get two free months of Skillshare when you click on the link below, plus it really helps out the channel. The free premium membership gives you unlimited access to must-know topics so you can improve your skills and learn new things, all free for two months. So get Skillshare and improve yourself now so you can start getting your dirt on your political opponents immediately. Do you agree with my grade? Are you as worried about the Republic as I am? Leave your objections in the comments and check out my other real law reviews over here where I will see you in court, I guess.